Thanks for listening to the Replatform podcast sponsored by Attractor Hypersonics and hosted by myself, James Gerd, and Paul Rogers. A warm welcome if it's your first episode. We put a lot of time and effort into bringing you this content uh, free of charge. Please help us keep it that way. Refer us to other people in your network. Let people know we exist. Share our posts on social media. And also, please do rate the show on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening. It really does help boost our profile and visibility. Right, thanks, and we hope you enjoy the latest episode. Paul, over to you to set up um, who we're talking to today. Lovely. So, um, essentially, I saw Andrew uh, on LinkedIn talking about some really interesting projects that he's undertaken as the, his role of head of e-com and retail innovation at Oxfam. Um, and I've always been a big fan of Oxfam. Growing up in Oxford, you know, they're a really big employer in the local area. And I actually applied to roles there when I was really young, um, unsuccessfully. Um, but I then reached out to Andrew and asked him to come onto the podcast and talk to us about some of the interesting things he's doing. So Andrew, thanks for joining us. And maybe initially, if you can just kind of give us a bit of an overview on your role and your background and, and also Oxfam as a business. Absolutely. Good afternoon to you both. Um, I've been with uh, Oxfam now for uh, nearly two years. Uh, my job title here is uh, Head of E-Commerce and Retail Innovation. So that includes uh, all the wonderful items that are donated by our customers, supporters and donators. And we sell those on uh, a couple of uh, marketplaces as well as our very own Oxfam online shop. Uh, and I also look after our Sourced by Oxfam team as well. So that's a range of fair trade, uh, ethically sourced products, everything from fair trade coffee, uh, tea and chocolate and some other wonderful items that, that uh, uh, our team of buyers and merchandisers can source from around the world in some of the communities where we work and also deliver programs. Lovely. And I guess um, that leads us nicely on to my first question, which um, I guess I've put down here as the obvious first question, because I think one of the things that people I'd imagine ask you a lot of the time is kind of, what does that assortment look like? Like which categories are you in and how are you kind of managing the, the donated items as well as those other items? So can you just give us a bit of an overview on that to start? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um in, in shop uh, and store, we tailor our product sets uh, of our new Source by Oxfam uh, product. And we do that in cooperation with our uh, shop teams. We we range various packages based on a, a shop size, its turnover. Uh, and as you might imagine, uh, all of the shops are unique in terms of their size and locations. Uh, they're not uh, cookie cutter size, as you might see in, in, in general retail. Um, we also work with our uh, shop teams and area managers uh, around specific uh, product that might sell well in a in a shop team. So if you take, for example, a shop maybe in a tourist district, uh, that might have different interests to one of our shops in a town centre. Um, and online is, is very different. Uh, and via our own online store, we offer up to a thousand SKUs of the Source by Oxfam product range. Again, anything from tea, chocolate, coffee, uh, handmade products uh, through various communities uh, that we saw uh, that we uh, source from and deliver program into. And this is really interesting because this often becomes a test bed of if it sells well online, uh, then maybe uh, there's an appetite for those particular products in our shops as well. It, it, the, the, it's not a science. Uh, sometimes customers who buy online buy different, uh, completely different products to 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 what we will sell physically. Um, and a donated stock is chosen by our shop network of what they want to list. So donated items uh, uh, that will be listed physically in shop. Uh, sold online and then dispatched uh, on uh, through our shop network as well. And um, we try as much as we can to try and coach that network into what's hot, what's not, uh, collectibles, uh, ranges of clothing, you know, um, uh, Doc Martens uh, uh, as a really good example, come in and out of fashion. And therefore we turn around to our shop sometimes and we give them that information just so we're, we're current on what our customers supporters and donators are looking for 
Amazing. It's quite it's quite an interesting setup because there's so, so many different like types of products um, and different sources. I'd love to know the so the, the shop listed items. What is the process? So how have you how have you managed the tech and tooling? Like, so what do local shops do versus what's centralized? Yeah, so I, I have to admit that our shops are, are probably some of our uh, true entrepreneurs that we've got in terms of if you've been a shop manager or if you've volunteered in some of our locations for quite some time, you'll know what sells particularly well. You'll know what uh, uh, customers are looking for online. So that that product selection from and ninety percent, ninety percent of our listings are generated by our shop and store network, whether that be shop manager or our range of volunteers. Um, they will use lots of tools to look for the price of the item if it's selling online, what it last sold for. That's how we try and gauge the price or how collectible it may be or how unique it may be. So as well as everyday items that. Uh, would be fashionable. You'll also have collectibles, maybe rare books, uh, maybe toys of yesteryear as well. So it's a real, a real big selection online. Um, Two hundred twenty-five thousand items, uh, unique items for sale currently on Oxfam Online Shop. So it really is. It's a treasure trove online. Attract your complete product discovery growth engine. Create relevant shopping experiences that convert into sales and grow online revenue with personalised search, merchandising and recommendation solutions powered by AI. Find out more at attract.com. Yeah, it is a, a, you know, a key question because so many people in, in omnichannel retail that have stores and have online stock is always the, the great challenge. How does how does that bit work in terms of control? Because an item lit, uploaded by one shop and then it's on the website, but it's also in the shop. How do you avoid it out of stock issues or overselling or, or is stock ring fenced for e-commerce when it's listed? Uh, it is uh, it is ring fenced. Um, so we apply the classic trait of uh, FOMO, fear of missing out, or when it's gone, it's gone. Uh, so sometimes you will find that some of these items are are, are, are very much individual. Um, you might get five copies of Peter Kay's car share on there, but you're not going to get five copies of a, you know, an old Atari uh, game station or a collectible vintage Playmobil fire engine, uh, etc. So uh, we we generally don't tend to have going out of stock issues on on donated product it is a singular item that we're selling and therefore that's how it's presented to customers yeah it, it makes perfect sense and one thing i'm i'm really interested in because uh, i've worked with quite a few charities and i also shop a lot in in charity shops as well because they are a treasure trove and it's this part of this recycling um you know reuse economy which which is really good is that i think people tend to think charity shop equals bargain equals cheap but actually, if you look at the product mix you've got, I mean, you've got things like a three hundred fifty pound leather jacket in the men's section. I'd love to know, right, pricing wise, how do you do? You do any automized automation in terms of determining price, or is this all about local shops um, determining price and uploading it um, what they think is relevant from a selling point of view? So, price is something which is is very emotive, um, and and what we do is we we let our shop have a real sense of generating the best value that they possibly can from a donated item. Ultimately, the person or the organization who's donated those items to us, they want us to try and reach the most amount of money we can in terms of uh, generating that funding for a program uh, that Oxfam delivers. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. But without... If I, if I dare say, without over-egging pricing, we try and keep pricing as to where it is in the marketplace. So, for instance, if that leather jacket is a branded leather jacket and it's selling elsewhere, we try and keep the pricing roughly the same as where else you may find that on, say, another marketplace uh, uh, or in another uh, collectible shop or a maybe a vintage online seller. We'll, tr we'll try and keep that pricing level. We'll hold the item for a few weeks at a current pricing level. 
and then we'll adjust that pricing level as we feel fit to try and uh, uh, gain some market traction where they ultimately sell the item. Right. Um, and one of the things that James was saying earlier was uh, he's uh, worked a lot more charities than I have um, and them kind of leveraging drop shipping to mini minimize the stock overhead. Um, and I guess you've talked about um, some of the different ways you fulfill orders already. Um, can you just talk us through kind of end to end that whole fulfillment and warehousing piece and how that's managed? I can. It's it's unique to Oxfam as, uh, in in the charity industry. And um, Oxfam, are, we're really fortunate. We've got two what I would class as mega centres. Uh, we have a, a really large industrial warehouse uh, unit in Yorkshire, which is about 100,000 square feet. And then we have one in the south in Milton Keynes, which is about 70,000 square feet. And what we do from uh, those particular two locations, and they're pinnacle really in terms of supply chain into our, into our own shops and stores, um, essentially they are stock holding and distribution into the shops uh, but equally, they can serve direct to customer too. Uh, and whilst we've got a third-party logistic solution as well, a 3PL, um, the whole operation is uh, choreographed, uh, especially at peak, such as sales and promotions and, and Christmas. So each centre has a, a full management team, uh, specifically experienced around logistics and warehouse operations, and, and that shop network also plays their part as well. So when items are uh, listed locally, such as donated books or clothing, uh, they themselves will handle the dispatch uh, of those items when they're sold to customers. So we can send direct to customer, direct from the shop where the item was listed as well. Right. Yeah, that sounds um, that sounds really cool. Um and another point, so I've worked with vintage clothing brands in the past, and it's and it's often a challenge where they very rarely receive the same item multiple times, or maybe they do, but it's it's still like a rare occurrence. Um, it's really hard to justify it, investment into content, even photography, stuff like that, and even harder for them, a lot of them are relatively low margin, but... Um, I guess the same principle applies. How have you found this challenge? Like, is this something you know you do a lot, or do you kind of go down the route of kind of bare bones content? Um, we've got a, a pretty good marketing team who will look at theming categories. So you're right, you know, an individual item that might cause an awful lot of interest, and um, it can be on sale for three or four days, and then it's gone. Uh, how do you create content around that? How do you drive traffic, et cetera? Well, um, unless it's a celebrity item and you're trying to, or you are you going to publicly auction that so you've got some longevity in the listing, uh, it's very difficult to do so. But you will find, as we speak now, we have themed some of our product sets online. You can go and search Prada. Uh, Prada appears as a brand on the front page of uh, Oxfam Online Shop. And therefore, we'll we'll try and theme product um, and categories so you get a selection of rather than a of than a uh, single unit. Yes, yeah, so that's very similar what the a lot of the vintage brands do. So, particularly from an organic search perspective, they'll invest that attention into the category pages and build kind of editorial content around it, and then the PDPs are a bit lighter. Um, so that makes sense, and I guess. Another question, and I think this is, you know, a much bigger question. Um, so Oxfam is a big business, you know, it's not a new business. And I'd assume that tech probably hasn't always been at the core of the business. Um, how have you found getting to this point with Oxfam and has Ecom been part of a transformation project or has it just been a case of incremental change over time? Oxfam deploys a retail transform a transformation team. And that transformation team will be working on several projects at uh, any one time. Um, again, we've got uh, an eye on future tech and development trends and customer be behavior and what's happening generally in retail. And I mean that from a sense of not just what's happening in charity retail. 
with most systems now in the cloud or indeed with AI a, a central theme, uh, we explore, test and build development into uh, annual budgets and growth. So um, it's certainly not NASA, uh, but with major brands such as uh, Oxfam uh, and customers expectations, moving forward with some innov uh, innovation is, is, is very much part of Oxfam's thinking uh, in retail. A question around the the um, the e-commerce tech stack. I think this would be very interesting for people listening. Um, what does it currently look like? I know you, you talked about before we start recording about being an um, Oracle backend. I know I've got a question afterwards about the marketplaces, so we'll come back to that. But what is your core core e-commerce stack for? Um, yeah, what what technology and tools are involved? Uh, Oracle does play uh, a component part in uh, uh, an Oxfam online shop, uh, but we do work with um, uh, most of the major tech players, uh, as you might expect. So most you would find in, in any of the uh, big brands in retailers, um, but, and, and, and I say but, and this is where we have agility and foresight in, in what we offer uh, and what it looks like and, and what we develop. We also work with quite a few uh, startups and new concepts. And in some areas, we're right on the edge of some of the latest developments around algorithms and customer interaction and AI. So Oxfam also get invited to uh, talk tech and category and future concepts. So where you might think uh, Oxfam follows, uh, sometimes we get to lead and that can be very exciting. Hypersonics helps e-commerce companies make more profit every day. This AI-driven platform delivers recommendations for pricing and inventory that lead to bigger profits. Visit hypersonics.ai forward slash podcast to get a free trial. And have, let's let's expand a bit on the marketplace strategy because uh, yeah, lots of people have uh, have pushed into marketplaces over the last couple of years. Uh, there's quite a, there's been quite a bit of diversification in the number of marketplaces available beyond the the obvious ones like the Amazons and Ebays. Now, from what I understood, you said you're on eBay and you're selling in the thousands of, of units a week. Etsy is going to be as focused for you. So I'd love love to know like why are marketplaces so important? And also, is this purely about acquisition or is this more about just evolving to where people are shopping um, uh, nowadays? Um, well, I have to say on that point that Oxfam Online Shop is um, uh, is is the mothership of uh, Oxfam's online presence. Uh, again, you know, two hundred twenty five thousand lines of inventory on that particular location. However, we do explore marketplaces in terms of uh, demographic uh, and uh, demographic interaction. We may work with particular retailers or some of the marketplaces around special promotions, um, and they could be fashion events or it could be a fair trade event, etc. cetera. Um, but, but Oxfam do feel it's important that uh, whilst uh, there's some uh, diversity in in areas of marketplaces, uh, we want to be inclusive in the offer that we have and obviously reach a quite a broad audience in terms of uh, product sets uh, that we stock and sell as well. And how did you approach, because you've got uh, quite a diverse product set um, and product data feeds are notoriously fun because each each destination has its own standards and requirements. How have you gone about that? Have you, have you built something custom yourselves to handle the data feeds or are you using a third party to push it out into all the marketplaces? We use some of the common <clears throat> tools, excuse me, that are available on, on the marketplace, uh, analytic tools. Uh, but we'll also look at some of the product sets that we have and who interacts with those product sets and uh, we'll also look at how those product sets uh, interact physically in shop and store as well. So uh, as a really good example, we, um, uh, we sell a product called I Was a Sari. Fantastic background to this particular product set. Um, 
It's uh, uh, from a, a company who we deal with in Mumbai, and that uh, company supports 170 ladies who essentially uh, scour the marketplaces for used saris. Then they convert them into clutch bags, sports bags, shopping bags, slippers, waistcoats, bandanas, uh, uh, scrunchies, a whole, a whole range uh, of products. And we know that that product has an interest with a particular demographic. We know a marketplace attracts that particular demographic, and therefore we expose the product in that particular area. Um, if you look at some of the auction sites as a really good example, <clears throat> if we find something very, very collectible, then we'll expose that on a auction-style uh, marketplace because we know uh, it'll generate an awful lot of interest. Uh, that interest will generate bids, and those bids will um, uh, hopefully generate quite a lot of income for us as well. And in terms of, of the technology of getting the, the product, so when you've selected your products for each marketplace, how are you pushing the product into the marketplace? Is somebody manually keying it, like they might set up a, a manual listing on your on your main website, or have you invested in any technology to automate, you know, uploading and syncing product data between your back end and, and marketplaces? Um, we, if we look at two different product sets, um, and if we look at uh, fashion versus books, um, Oxfam's got one of the, if not the largest um, uh, pre-loved book businesses. Uh, in the UK, uh, worth around £20 million in terms of sales revenue. And uh, our shop teams and uh, one of our uh, hubs, one of our warehouse locations, will use a level of automation in terms of barcode or ISBN scanning to understand um, the background of the book uh, and maybe some detail around it, including pricing. That's really easy to do because you're using a uh, an ISBN or a barcode. And of course, there are central uh, uh, repositories in terms of uh, pricing and information based on, on that search. Um, that's something that we continue to develop. And we continue to have a look and experiment with levels of automation as well, i.e. books on a conveyor belt and scanning those books and looking at various speeds and how we then take images and upload onto our, onto our, uh, onto our listing tool, et cetera. From a fashion pers uh, perspective, it's very different. Um, you need to have a look at the garment in terms of uh, quality, uh, in terms of size, um, and in terms of label. Uh, and clothing generally doesn't carry a barcode, and there's certainly no uh, central repository of uh, how much that dress is sold for and on a marketplace previously. So um, I have to say that it's a very manual interaction, but I think what customers are looking for is they're looking for something in, in, in that fashion category where it has to be uniquely listed, several photographs, uh, you'll need uh, item specifics and a description. You'll want to know what the size is and the quality. Sometimes we have to put measurements on there as well. So the product would need to be physically measured because some of the brands and retailers' sizes can actually be quite different. What's, what's large for one particular retailer uh, might only be medium for another retailer. So there's a very manual interaction with with that particular category. But I think that's what customers customers want to know what they're buying. They're wanting to know the quality. They want to know the condition. And therefore, you've got to have that manual interaction with the product. That makes sense. Um, and then another question that I really wanted to delve into a little bit. So within your title, you have the words retail innovation. Um, can you talk us through some of the things you've done on that side within the physical retail stores? Absolutely. Um, Oxfam are, are currently embarking on a very ambitious uh, superstore uh, opening plan. Uh, so we plan to open a, a, a number of superstores. We already have one uh, which is in Oxford and is particularly interesting. It has a drive through donation station, uh, which uh, attracts an awful lot of visitors and donations. 
Uh, it's also got a caffeine side as well, which is, uh, I think, something quite new to the to the charity retailing uh, model. On an innovation uh, perspective in terms of tech, uh, we look at a number of ways in, in how we interact with our customers, supporters, and donators. And um, whilst it may not be new to the charity sector, you can go onto uh, Oxfam's uh, website, you can download a label, or you can request a bag. So if you're having a bit of a sort out one weekend, you want to send us uh, lots of clothes and books and jewelry, work, you know, uh, 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 maybe it's complete or, or incomplete, then you can do so, or you can simply uh, download a prepaid label, stick it in the box, and you can dispatch that through one of the collection centers from one of the couriers, uh, and that comes into Oxfam. One of the further developments from that that we are looking at uh, very keenly is with one of the um, big UK um, carriers or courier delivery companies, and that's how you can use their app to say, I've got something that I would like to donate to Oxfam, and uh, during their collection round, they will actually come and collect that from your chosen address. You could take it into work, you could have it collected from home when it's convenient to you. And I think that's the whole point of convenience. When is it convenient to the donor to uh, 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 to, to have that parcel collected? Uh, because we do know that whilst we're eternally grateful for all of our donations that we receive, it can be quite difficult sometimes trying to park outside a high street shop and make a donation there and then. Absolutely, yeah. That sounds um, that sounds really good for like reducing friction on the, on the donations piece. Um, where in Oxford is the um, the kind of superstore? Uh, I will have to give you the address. Uh, it um, because I'm not quite sure the name of the trading park. I drive to it. I drive to it almost every other week, but it's um, where the Premier Inn is in Cowley. Yeah. Not far away from the mini factory, there's an industrial estate yeah. just behind Harley Davidson and the superstores in that and, and retail park industrial estate. Probably more useful for me than our listeners, but um, still very, very good. Um, so that's great. And I guess in, in ter- continuing on that theme, do you have any intention of kind of building out a multi-channel feature or do you already have that? So if I go into a store, you know, and there's a certain thing I'm looking for and, you, and that store doesn't have it. Um, you know, things like Endless Isle and then equally things like Click and Collect. Like, is any of that on your roadmap? We've done Click and Collect from uh, the Superstore in Oxford. Um, um, so items that you would normally find quite difficult to uh, to sell uh, um, online, sorry. So drum kits, wardrobes, white goods, um, we've offered a click and collect service for that particular product, uh, and that's worked extremely well for the superstore. So, in future superstore rollout, we will want to offer a click and collect. But let me just add on the tech piece uh, mm-hmm. because um, uh, Oxfam attends uh, up to 12 festivals each year, and of course, Glastonbury being uh, by far the largest, we'll have three stores that we will retail from uh, at Glastonbury. And one thing we are doing new uh, this year is we are applying a QR code to the pricing label on each of the items that we will actually transact at Glastonbury. The intention is to to say thank you in terms of buying an item whilst we were uh, retailing at a festival this year. Uh, There'll be a bit of a discount uh, uh, in terms of once you've scanned the QR code, uh, we'll give a discount uh, off your next purchase online. And what we're trying to do is maybe maybe those customers have not shopped with, shopped with Oxfam before online, and we're trying to attract them and retain them as a uh, as a shopper with us. Hey, so I've got a question on um, on roadmap management because this is always an interesting one to know where it sits because you've got all these different streams to to the e-commerce strategy all these different product sets and obviously you're working with um you know i guess there's different technology involved um as well how would you handle the e-commerce roadmap yeah obviously it sits within your area but do you manage it directly yourself do you have a product manager i'd love to hear about how you go about deciding 
and who has responsibility for like prioritizing what goes into the development here? Certainly. Um, gosh, I did explain earlier, this is not NASA. And uh, <laughs> what we do is uh, at the beginning of the year, we put together a plan of what we would like to roll out uh, during the next 12 months. We work with our colleagues in retail transformation and our IT team to look at uh, what some of those major projects consist of, uh, which will deliver uh, the most value, and uh, which are uh, 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 as least complex as possible because it, it takes up less resource from a, a physical uh, team in terms of deployment. And we'll put all that into the mix. Uh, we have lots of ongoing meetings in terms of how we're progressing some of the solutions that we already have. Of course, what you have to be really mindful about is that something will come along, and they have done, uh, a month after you've set that plan out, or even a quarter after you've set that plan out, and it'll be, we, we can't miss this one. We've, we've got to do this. So you'll have a look then in terms of resource, in terms of planning. There'll be a bit of a juggle if you can to move some of the projects back or try and do them simultaneously if you if we possibly can with the resource. Um, but I would say it's a real team effort. So everyone feeds in ideas. We put that into a roadmap and we'll then push that roadmap out over a, over a 12-month period. Yeah, and, and uh, if... If you don't mind answering this one as well, um, what does the e-commerce team structure that has? I know you, you look after the retail piece as well, but specifically in e-com, like what roles do you prioritize in-house? Because there, there's always a lot of admin um, and ongoing merchandising work involved when you've got like such a broad product catalog. So I'd love to Absolutely, yeah. So we uh, we have a, a full complement uh, within a marketing team who are dedicated to uh, online uh, through SEO, um, uh, Google Ad uh, interaction. Um, then we have uh, physical teams who are located at the uh, big distribution centers that we have. Sourced by Oxfam is a 20-person team from uh, buying and merchandising uh, and, and and an admin function in that respect as well. And and the the source by Oxfam team are, um, is a very interesting component part because you might think, yeah, hey, that's that that's quite a few people, twenty people working in in that particular division. Source by Oxfam is worth uh, in sales revenue around about fifteen million pounds in uh, annual sales. So it's it's a medium sized business in in its own right, really, and therefore deserves that um, that function. Uh, is one of the reasons why it's successful because um, uh, that team is made up of uh, some very good uh, seasoned buyers who specialize in those particular categories. Um, food uh, last year uh, was plus twenty five percent. So again, it it just shows that having that correct resource to to serve that particular department. And uh, before I open the floodgates on um, uh, every supplier uh, who might listen to this thinking, oh, some of our items might fit well on uh, on the Oxford Online Shop, uh, we, we have a very stringent uh, ethical supply framework. We're, we're very keen in terms of where the product comes from, who owns the organization, um, if a living wage is being paid uh, by the workers in any particular country where the products are sourced from, how um, uh, sustainable the product is, and if the packaging is recyclable as well. So that sourced by Oxfam stamp on something really does mean that we have done an awful lot of due diligence to make sure that when we put that product on the shelf and we put the Oxfam name behind it, uh, our customers know what they're buying. Um, and then one last question um, that we've added in ad hoc. Um, and is there any kind of new digital or retail tech that really interests you? Or like what technology are you most interested in that you think could be applied to Oxfam? We deploy um, something at the moment through one of our um, uh, marketplaces in terms of uh, AI for 
customer interaction. Uh, and I think AI is proving to be very interesting in um, in the retailing marketplace in general. The piece of tech that we deploy essentially will pick up on a question answered by a, a customer or a prospective customer. So you may be looking at an item that you've seen for sale on uh, Oxfam online shop or on one of the marketplaces, and uh, you'll send, uh, I wonder if, uh, so you can ask that question, and normally what would happen is that would have to be picked up by uh, uh, one of our team who might have to go and have a look at the item, just double check, uh, is it bright purple, is it deep purple, um, and then make a response uh, back to that customer, prospective customer. Uh, similarly, you may get questions around, I've ordered an item, when's it due for delivery? Or if we're selling an item on auction, will you end the auction now so I can do a buy it now? Is probably one of the most popular questions that we get. All those questions we can answer automatically. So even if the customer's asking a question at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning, we can automatically deploy a response to that customer. I think it's important that um, customer feels that they're getting a instant response rather than having to potentially wait two or three working days, especially over the recent bank holidays that we've had before they get an, an answer, before they make a decision whether to bid or buy. So uh, AI, I think, is uh, is very interesting, and I think it's still got um, some interesting developments in retail to come. Excellent. Uh, look, Andy, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, really, really enjoy that. Uh, yeah, we're, we're both big fans of Oxfam. We've shopped in many of the, the shops over the years, so it's really interesting to then see the, the, the technology view behind the scenes. So appreciate you taking the time. It's a pleasure, and, and thank you for inviting me onto the show. That's great, and thanks to everyone for listening. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we do. Do keep your ear open. For our next episode, we drop one every Tuesday. Remember to give us that rating on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever else you're listening. And make sure you pop down to your local Oxfam shop and support the local community. Thanks, everyone. Take care. For more information on this topic, head over to replatform.fm for our audio podcasts. To discuss a project, or if you'd like to chat about any of the topics covered in this episode in more detail, please reach out to myself, James Gerd, or my co-host, Paul Rogers, via LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks again for listening, and keep your ears peeled for the next episode.